Welcome back to the Arise interview. I'm Charles Enyegoldo. Now, there's been a sustained drop in the number of confirmed COVID-19 cases across Africa over the past month. The number of new cases has been reducing by an average of 10% per week. So far, there have been 1.4 million confirmed cases of COVID-19 in Africa and just over 34,000 deaths, considerably lower than Asia, Europe or North and South America. The African Centers for Disease Control said early interventions played a crucial role in curbing the spread of the virus, as did experience in contact tracing from fighting diseases like Ebola. And the African CDC described as false suggestions that cases and deaths in Africa have been significantly underreported. The Africa CDC has supported member states in two broad areas first in the preparedness and then secondly in the response. In the preparedness phase of the COVID pandemic, <clears throat> we did a couple of things. Firstly, we supported member states to equip them with the ability to diagnose the virus, which initially, as of January, no country in Africa had that, the diagnostics. We had the lab capacity, but lacked the diagnostics. So we supported that effort to ramp it up to 48 countries very quickly. We've also supported countries to build up their surveillance systems for the virus. That is enhanced screening at the port of entry and to tracking the uh, people that are infected. We've also been very active in supporting countries in their infection prevention control activities, which is critical. If we have to <clears throat> prevent our healthcare workers, we have to make sure that they are armed with infection prevention control measures. We've also been very keen to make sure that communication is effective by designing risk communication capacity development efforts through the partnerships or the task force that we established called the African Task Force for Coronavirus Preparedness and Response. In the response phase, we have been very active in rolling out diagnostics, placing people in countries like in Nigeria, Cameroon, Cote d'Ivoire, Zambia, South Africa, and we continue to increase our efforts to scale up the diagnostic capacity. We all know that COVID response requires that we test people we isolate them and trace their contacts. And that's the director of the African Centers for Disease Control. Well, for more on how Africa uh, in general and West Africa in particular appears to be getting a handle on the spread of the coronavirus, I'm joined now by West Africa's health chief, Professor Stanley Okolo, director general of the West African Health Organization, WAHO. Uh, Professor Okolo, thank you very much indeed for joining us. Um, and we heard the African Center for uh, diseases, as African centers for disease control, they're saying early intervention meant there were no mass burials, uh, unlike elsewhere uh, in other parts of the world. I mean, looking specifically at the area where you have charge, which is West Africa, what was that intervention and what factors were at play? Okay, um, thank you so much for having me, Charles. Uh, John Kengasong, who is the director of Africa CDC, is correct in the fact that we had sub-regional activities that were effective in the initial stages in containing this virus and this pandemic. Now, West Africa actually is in the forefront of that. You know that post-Ebola, or you may know that post-Ebola, we set up what is called national public health institutions in all our 15 countries. Now, that wasn't there before Ebola. What that did was to bring together the, the laboratory capacity, the epidemiological capacity in terms of surveillance and preparedness and response. And we were doing simulation exercises. We did it for yellow fever, and we also have it for all that. But also bring forward the issue of training of workforce and research. And we have that. So that positioned us in having a disease surveillance architecture that was good enough. When the WHO declared COVID-19 a public health emergency of international concern, which was on the 30th of January, West Africa, ECOWAS, who were the first in all African regions to immediately organize 
a regional meeting of all the 15 ministers in Bamako on the 14th of February. And what we did there was to agree a regional approach to talk about how we are going to step up surveillance at the borders, how we are going to support the countries to do that. Waho had the countries with a lot of thermal cameras and the rest of them to agree how we are going to build up the laboratory capacity at the time that this COVID-19 was declared an emergency of international concern. We had only one laboratory in IPD, Institute Pasteur in Dakar, that was able to test for coronavirus. And with the collaboration with Africa CDC, we were able to ensure within a short period of time, by the beginning of February, before we even had that meeting on the 14th, that about five or six countries were able to test. Dakar, Ghana, Nigeria, Mali, and a couple other countries. Then Waho immediately, on its own, went up to ensure that all our 15 countries had the laboratory and the kits to test. So that is one thing. The second thing is the fact that the strong coordination and collaboration and communication that we have in West Africa is second to none. And that means that we have regular meetings, weekly meetings. We also plug in, of course, to the Africa CDC task force. But we in West Africa, we have these strong collaborations such that what is happening in Senegal is known in Mali and is known in Niger because we have these regional regular coordination meetings. What does that do for us? It brings lessons to be learned across. It means that WAHO can easily support countries that are weaker. It means that even when WAHO wants to bring forward some of the regional stuff that we have in terms of diagnostics, in terms of personal protective equipment, easily do that by getting a country next to the others we have done before, take something from Senegal to Cabo Verde, and then we take from WAHO regional stuff to replenish for Senegal. And then the third thing we did was to set up virtual training, because as you know, the difference between the pandemic and Ebola is that Ebola was in three countries and we were able to go and support those countries with rapid response teams. Pandemic, COVID-19, all 15 countries, borders closed. How could we support each other? WAHO immediately utilized the release of some of those regional rapid response teams who are citizens of member states. And we did that across several of our countries by giving funds, to get these people out from wherever they were working outside the public sector and then pay for them to be in the public sector. And then we were, of course, running all these training. So far, we have trained about 3,000 people. We have run about 22 to 25 training courses with high impact faculty. And that is not then, of course, to talk about the concept note in terms of a regional response that we had and we developed at Bamako on the 14th of February that has now been put in place. We were able to raise about 39 million out of $51 million using also the WAHO funds, but external donors. And that is why you saw us in August go to all 15 countries to give them a massive supply of medical, critical medical materials, such that none of our 15 countries at the moment will run out of stock over the next. Right. Eight okay. To 10. I'm just going to come in there, uh, Professor. Colour, um, thank you for setting that out and um, to some extent talking up the, the way that, you know, the, the West Africa has responded in particular and Africa in general. Um, you, you mentioned things like scaled up testing and so on. I mean, the fact remains that it doesn't matter how much you've done, um, testing in West Africa and across Africa is still very low um, and that really doesn't explain why the, you know, the whole coronavirus thing is coming down in West Africa, does it? I mean, or, or, the numbers are not as high as, you know, most experts thought that it would be. Um, I mean, one of the main factors that's been talked about um, had, is the fact that Africa has an extremely young population. The average age is 18, uh, as opposed to Europe, where the average age is 42. I mean, could that be a large factor here? Okay. So I think one of the things we have to accept is that Africa's level of testing, we set ourselves a target of 
at the moment in our region we have about five or six countries that have met that one percent and the rest are less in other words testing one percent of the population however having said that one of the things we know is that even with those countries like Cabo Verde that have tested 7% of the population, or something like Ghana that has tested about 1.5% of the population, we know that the positivity rate is similar. And we also know that one of the things that we are doing is that we are testing in across all our countries, the symptomatics and the contacts, and we have this test, trace, and treat strategy. And that is a way of containing public health event. Now, when we come to the question of why is it that we don't have as many cases, two things we have to think of. When you talk about the young population, yes, yes the demography means that we have young population. But by the way, coronavirus affects everyone, all ages. The only difference is that the death rates in the young population is less than in the older Right. It looks like uh, we, we lost him for a minute there. We will try and get back to him. I mean, we're due to take a break in a minute anyway. But uh, I suppose one of the, the things I was hoping to, to ask him about before we go on this particular break, break was the fact that in his area of jurisdiction, he's the, the uh, health chief, if you like, in West Africa, uh, in the, world, uh, uh, the West African Health Organization, which is part of ECOWAS. Um, that the, the region has, of course, and I think he touched on this earlier, has dealt with epidemics like Ebola. I mean, Nigeria was commended hugely for the way that it had handled the Ebola crisis. Um, and that meant that a lot of countries were actually already geared up for these types of health crises, which may have given them some kind of advantage, whereas with a lot of the other international um, countries and so on, that um, these things, uh, they, they, they were trying to catch up because they'd never had to deal with those kinds of massive in infections, um, uh, diseases like Ebola, and uh, that sort of perfected Nigeria's ability to uh, contact, trace, and all the rest of it. And I think the Director General actually mentioned that. Um, Director General, if you can hear me, uh, let me ask you one quick question before we have to take a break. Uh, and if you could keep it brief, that would be interesting. But we'll come back to you immediately. Uh, that would be good. We'll come back to you immediately after the break. Um, do you think that because of things like Ebola and so on, I think you mentioned that, that um, countries like Nigeria were already geared up for this type of in, uh, pandemic, um, epidemic, if you like. Uh, we have less than a minute. Oh, uh, Charles, and that's exactly what happened. What's happening in Nigeria, where you are, is exactly what's happening in other countries. The National Center for Disease Control, which is the technical backbone of the response in Nigeria, is also one of the national public health institutions that I was talking about. So in Nigeria, it's called the NCDC. In other countries, it's called different things. But the fact is that those countries that maintained the NCDC or the NPHI as their technical backbone found that their response efforts were much better. Okay, uh, Professor Okolo, please stay with us. We would like to talk with you some more. You're watching The Arise interview. Plenty more still ahead as we continue our chat about the falling number of reported new infections of the coronavirus in Africa. Stay with us. Welcome back to the Arise interview. I'm Charles Anyagoldo. Now, the rate of coronavirus infections in Africa is at its lowest level in a month and has been dropping steadily by about 10% a week, puzzling health experts in the West and around the world. Africa has seen about 1.4 million cases and 34,000 deaths since March, figures that are far lower than those in Europe, Asia or the Americas, with reported cases continuing to decline. The African continent has more than one billion people, but accounts for just under 5% of cases globally, 
and 3.6% of deaths. African states introduced a series of measures to tackle the virus as soon as the first cases were reported. Many, including South Africa and Nigeria, introduced national lockdowns, but others, such as Ethiopia, opted for less strict measures. While there may be cases that have gone undetected, experts say there is no indication of a large number of unexplained deaths in most countries, but there are warnings there could be a second wave of infections as more countries relax restrictions. And West Africa's health chief, Professor Stanley Okolo, Director General of the West African Health Organization, WAHO, is still with me via online WebEx. Thank you very much indeed, Professor Okolo, for staying with us. It's interesting, isn't it, that early forecasts for COVID-19 in Africa were quite apocalyptic. I mean, suggesting that African health services would be overwhelmed. Um, those forecasts now appear to have been confounded. Yes, I think you're absolutely correct, Charles. And I think it's important to learn some lessons from, from our side. People think that Africa has not got anything. In fact, uh, it is interesting that some of the discussions we have had with some people, they even question why should we be looking at buying ventilators for African hospitals uh, for severe cases. Now, the fact is Africa has a lot going for it. Africa has had a lot of preparation. African countries have done a lot in West Africa that I know about. We had national lockdowns with almost all the countries. Only one or two had a partial lockdown. But the drop in cases which you talk about, we look at seven-day rolling average. And we knew when we were at our peak. And we saw when it's been dropping gradually. And it has been dropping gradually over the past few weeks. There hasn't been a dramatic drop. But the other thing that is interesting is that within our countries, three or four are actually increasing their testing centers, increasing their testing rates. Yet, the drop on seven-day rolling average continues. So that shows you that this is not a fluke. It is not an artifact. The second thing to say is that there still are occasionally clusters. So, for example, in Senegal, following the drawdown of the ECOWAS Regional Stabilization Force in the Gambia and in Bissau. Some of the soldiers went back and Senegal then had this testing system of trying to test them within those military contingents. And they did discover some cases. That, of course, spiked their number of cases for that week. But that is a cluster. That is not a continuing community transmission. And you will see that across a lot of our countries. So testing rates are increasing, but the positivity rates are decreasing in some of the countries. And that is really important to think about. That. Nevertheless, uh, Professor Okolo, the, um, the, 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 the apparent drop in uh, the number of new infections in Africa and the very low numbers in the first place continues to puzzle international health experts, not just in the West, but, but, but around the world. And there have been suggestions by epidemiologists that Africans have a pre-existing immunity to COVID-19 uh, caused possibly by exposure to other infections. I mean, but that has not been conclusively proven, has it? Theories. There is that theory you're talking about. There is the theory of uh, having the BCG vaccination, which some people have talked about, which is very widespread, the vaccination against TB. No, really, I think we ourselves also, let me not um, um, forget to mention this. We ourselves would like to know the exact cause of this. And so what we are doing in about three of our countries at the moment is that we are setting up to do community surveillance. And that means that we will go and use the countries, some of them that have low rates, as a random representative sampling of going into community and testing people. We test about 500 randomly. 
And then we would want to know what is the rate of positivity in people who have no symptoms whatsoever, and we are testing them randomly. The theory that we have to prove is that the rate of positivity in them is very low. Because if that is low, that means that the drop that we are finding is an accurate drop. If the rate of positivity in the community is higher or equal to what we are getting with people who are the target subjects for testing, those who are traveling, those who have symptoms and their contacts, then it means that maybe there is a problem in terms of us catching the people who have this. And we're going to do that over the next two weeks, two to three weeks maximally, because the countries have already set themselves up to do it, and WAHO is going to support that. Well, do let us know how that turns out. But just in, in terms of the robustness of these figures that show that Africa appears to have the pandemic under control. I mean, there have been questions, as we said, raised about that. I mean, Kenya recently changed its testing to focus just on high risk groups, and that resulted in the case numbers dropping. Similarly, South Africa has also changed its testing just to more vulnerable groups. I mean, but the African CDC says that this is a false narrative and that they are all doing things correctly. Yes, you, you see, this is really management, uh, uh, Charles. Uh, the, the cost of a PCR test for us is about $15 for just the test before you then start adding on the sampling uh, thing you use, the manpower and the extraction reagents. Africa, we do not have as many tests as America or Europe. Therefore, we are not going to be in a position to test the whole population. However, we are doing the right thing, and some of those countries are doing those right things, in testing the people who are most at risk, in testing the healthcare workers, in testing the frontline teachers, in testing those with symptoms and their contacts, in testing people who are traveling. So we really know that the public health approach we are using is the right one. But let me sound a note of caution. We are now at the verge of opening our borders. And we know that some of the surge, the second surge, happened to countries as they opened their borders. The other thing is not just that it's imported cases, but it's also a relaxation of the citizens and the population to the fact that you're opening borders, they think, therefore, you have defeated coronavirus. We have not defeated coronavirus. What we are seeing is a reduction in the coronavirus rates. But coronavirus is going to be with us for a long time. And it pains me sometimes to go out and see people without masks, people not social distancing, people not washing their hands. The virus is going to be with us for some time. And if we're not careful, and make sure we have a stepwise approach to opening our borders, we may have a problem. And our countries, and in WAHO, we are uh, tasking our countries, supporting them, and encouraging them to be smart in even introducing lockdowns in hotspots, and also in introducing restrictions on people from certain countries if we believe that they have very high burden. Well. Uh Professor Stanley Okolo, I really want to thank you for uh, staying, talking to us today and some very interesting uh, points that you've raised there. Professor Stanley Okolo is West Africa's Health Chief, the Director General of the West African Health Organization, WAHO. That's it for this edition of the Arise interview. Join us again tomorrow from me and the entire team here in Abuja. Bye-bye and thank you for watching.